Good evening, and thank you for that nice introduction. Um, and I want to add that I am co-owner of the cafe. My husband is the one that you might see there more often than I am. Well, I want to extend a big thank you to the Coles Library staff, um, especially Claudia Frazier and Bart Schmidt, as well as Professor Lyons for the invitation to be here today and for hosting this wonderful event. Tonight's talk is titled Home Away From Home, and that is a very appropriate title because from the university's beginnings in 1881, students have relocated here to the Drake neighborhood to attend the university. But I'd like you to imagine this, instead of today's incoming freshman class filling out their roommate compatibility survey for their dorm assignment, that instead they had to select from one of the student housing options from the late 1880s and early 1900s. You could choose from asking your parents to purchase a lot in a university subdivision and building a house, moving in with relatives near campus, renting a room, probably with other students, or joining a social organization so that you could rent a house. Home building, familial ties, rooming, boarding, renting, those housing options have influenced the growth and development of the Drake neighborhood. Tonight I will share about an exciting history project that's been happening, co-sponsored by the Drake Neighborhood Association. It's called the Drake Neighborhood Architectural and Historical Survey. I'll highlight some of the survey's historical findings that relate to off-campus student housing through the decades and showcase an online database that's the official repository for the survey research. Now, historians like to give a little perspective, and so with that, I need to, before delving into the historical findings, provide a little background information. For those of you who are not familiar with the Drake Neighborhood Association, I'd like to make your acquaintance with this nonprofit organization. Drake Neighborhood residents, business owners, and Drake University staff founded the association in 1979 with the purpose of improving the area. At the time, it was the second neighborhood association in the city of Des Moines and played a key role in pioneering neighborhood associations as grassroots community partners with the city. Today, the city of Des Moines recognizes more than 50 neighborhood associations and more continue to develop. The Drake Neighborhood Association represents one of the largest neighborhoods in the city, both by population and square blocks. It encompasses some 1,100 acres. The boundaries extend from Martin Luther King Parkway in the east, 42nd Street in the west, I-235 to the south, I guess I could be pointing these out here, and to the north, Franklin Avenue. As the association's name reflects, at the heart of the Drake neighborhood lies the Drake University campus. This relationship with the community surrounding the campus extends all the way back to the beginnings of Drake University. As the neighborhood has developed, so has the university. To more fully understand the past and to better plan for the future, the Neighborhood Association and City of Des Moines partnered on grant writing and sponsorship of the Drake Neighborhood Historical and Architectural Survey. This joint city neighborhood project is co-funded and overseen by the State Historic Preservation Office, funded in part by the National Park Service, U.S. Department of the Interior. I'm supposed to say that each time I talk about it. Um, historical consultant James Jacobson was hired to conduct the survey and examine prior research that has been done, create a bibliography, identify historic context for further study, and evaluate properties to assist in the identification and potentially um, looking at significant architectural sites and districts. The survey fulfills several goals. One is to survey the neighborhood as a whole, which has never been done before, because it's functioned as a distinct area whose sections share an interconnected history. Number two is to continue the City of Des Moines Community Development Department's efforts to survey and evaluate older residential and commercial districts. The third goal is to safeguard the city's heritage by guiding preservation and planning efforts. A fourth goal is to involve local residents. The Neighborhood Association has a long history of grassroots involvement, and the survey and related projects have already provided opportunities for hands-on participation. And I'm pleased to report that the Drake University community has been involved. Um, students and faculty have been involved with research and other aspects, including Mara has been very involved. 
um, and working alongside with neighborhood and other um, interested residents and genealogists. The fifth goal is to promote public awareness and contribute to the growing body of historical research about Des Moines. And, and this is done through a public history in the digital realm so that people can research and contribute to the ongoing documentation of the neighborhood. What, so um, the way that we're getting into the digital realm is an innovative searchable website that was developed by Drake neighborhood resident Steve Wilkie Shapiro, who is one of the co-leaders of the neighborhood survey. All the findings about people, buildings, and photographs associated with the neighborhood association will be input into this website. Um, the website is considered to be a groundbreaking endeavor because it's linking photographs, oral histories, building documentation, and historical context into a master web of information. So its purpose is really to be a living and growing document. And it will serve as a tool for historical research, genealogical discovery, and documentation of the neighborhood's history. The online database is searchable by address, name, and architectural style, among other search, um, searchable functions. It can help locate key information about when a house was built, who lived in the house early on, photographs of people and buildings. There are also many volunteer opportunities available to assist with adding information to the database. So if you're inter interested in um, finding out more, please log on to historicdrakeneighborhood.org. With that uh, background, I'm going to now segue into highlighting some findings about off-campus student housing drawn from the Historical and Architectural Survey Draft Report. The final report will be completed this summer. <clears throat> the Drake neighborhood can be called the original northwest side of Des Moines. Settlement began with farmsteads and in the 1870s clusters of the earliest suburban development in the metro area. But it was the founding of Drake University in 1881 that set into motion development patterns that have continued and endured since. And I'd just like to point out the boundaries of Des Moines when Drake was founded. This is today's University Avenue, which was called North because it was the northern boundary, and 28th Street, which was the western boundary, right there. So far from starting out in the midst of a wilderness, as is often recounted in a myth of Chancellor George Carpenter climbing an elm tree and finding the perfect location for the campus, there's actually a stone outside of Old Main that you may be familiar with that um, is engraved with uh, a little resting point of where the, the elm used to be. The new Drake University in the suburb of University Place began next to an established um, suburban area right here, the Cottage Grove Edition, which it was already a successful um, upper middle class development. And it encompassed part of the city proper, as well as part of the unincorporated areas that lay outside the city boundaries. It also adjoined an existing successful suburb of North Des Moines, which had already paved Forest Avenue to the north in brick. There was also the reality that the northwest part of the city was really the only acceptable location. It was distant from any competitor and from corrupting influences of the city. It was also located on high and dry land far from the flood prone areas near the river. And finally, the location played into the hands of a number of its key local supporters, not the least of whom was Dr. Turner who owned the streetcar franchise and happened to own this plot of land just on the other side of the new Drake University campus. The location was strategic and part of it was because they were learning from past mistakes. Drake was established out of a school that had floundered. It was called Oskaloosa College. It had been founded in 19, or 1857 rather in Oskaloosa, Iowa. It was affiliated with the Disciples of Christ and that um, experiment with how they had structured the school just had not worked out. And so a number of key backers had pulled away and there was this interest in starting the school afresh. And uh, Des Moines provided an ideal place to do so because it was um, the new capital of the state and there was a lot of business activity happening here. And as a side note, Drake was affiliated with Disciples of Christ Church until the early 1900s. Officially the break happened then. 
So the former chancellor of Oskaloosa College, George Carpenter, rallied support for moving the school to Des Moines, tapping into Disciples of Christ ministers as well as businessmen. Important startup funds came from a $20,000 donation to, from General Francis Marion Drake. He was a Civil War general, a railroad president, and perhaps most importantly, brother-in-law of George Carpenter. To ensure steady funding, a land trust was created by the university trustees, including General Drake, and along with other prominent businessmen, including lawyers, real estate agents, and bankers. They called it the University Land Company. And they purchased 140 acres, mostly unincorporated land, just outside the city of Des Moines boundaries. The land company platted 456 residential lots around the, the five-acre campus. So the campus originally from 25th to 27th Streets North, which is today's university, and university, which is today's Carpenter. Names get a little confusing when we go back in time. Um, and then what was the benefit to the university was that there were these lots, and then each time one was sold, a quarter of the proceeds went to the university. And then they were also receiving building um, company stock to use toward a building fund. So there was this really sophisticated financial approach to um, the university from the beginning. And it's really considered an innovative financing plan, certainly the first used in Des Moines, and then it was replicated by at least two other colleges in, in the city. But it may have been the first in Iowa. That's something that we haven't um, fully discovered yet. Sales of the land through the land company were very successful and also later inspired the university to directly enter into real estate development and sales. And in turn, those successes made the university successful. It was ranked as the fastest growing Iowa college in the late 19th century. The University Land Company carefully planned an attractive suburban community called University Place. It followed a uniform grid system which set it apart from the haphazardly developed city um, in Des Moines. The lots were created to appeal to middle class and upper middle class residents considered to be good moral neighbors who would help um, build houses, send their children to Drake University, and support the university. Home building by these upstanding citizens was very important to the university for housing students. Many of them boarded with local families. In the first university catalog of 1881-82, the university emphasized the profoundly moral and Christian character and influences of the school, quote, so that parents may feel assured that their children will be here in the very best influences. Most of the students can find lodging under the immediate care of one of the professors or in Christian families near the university. Trustees, professors, and even the first chancellors built homes to set an example of the high quality housing that the university desired in order to recruit and retain students. And this house still stands. The brick facade has been removed, but it's uh, still in existence on Cottage Grove. The campus itself was small, and we already talked about its boundaries. The first building was the student home, which was built in 1881 and paid for using proceeds from the lot sales. This served as a temporary general use building until the brick main building, which we now call Old Main, was completed in 1883. Students and even some of the faculty lived here in the student home, and they also attended their classes there. This foray into on-campus dormitory space ended when the building was dismantled in 1894 and there would be no more on-campus dorms until Morehouse was um, completed in about 1931. So the growing student body was left to find its own housing, and really it was the local houses that provided the housing for students. As University Place grew, residents in the area outside of the Des Moines boundaries sought to maintain local control and they filed for incorporation of the town of University Place in 1883. Given the close ties with the university, it seemed natural for the University Place Town Council to meet at Drake's main building. This municipal use, coupled with the building's use as a chapel, especially on weekends, reinforced the campus as a village green, centered in the middle of a community where all needs were being met. 
The land company dissolved in 1886 and the university itself took over platting and selling another 200 lots through the early 20th century. Alumni were some of the targeted audiences. And I realize I've rearranged my slides a little bit, so I'm going to skip ahead here. Um, the alumni were being targeted in this uh, yearbook cartoon is, is uh, kind of showing the excitement that lot sales had for alumni. And meanwhile, other investors jumped into the development fray. The Vermont Syndicate was one such group that developed Kingman Place west of the campus. And there was a lot of um, excitement that was seen in um, advertisements for auctions and, and spec homes that were available. We've done a study of Iowa censuses, which were conducted in um, five years off of when the U.S. censuses were being conducted. So 1885 and 1895 state censuses, and then the U.S. census of 1900. And we can see that students were being housed in private homes, including those of professors. Many likely had a familial or social connection with the host family. They tended to be segregated by sex, and it's not what we don't know is what the day-to-day the -day experience was like. So things like did, how many students were um, receiving board as well as just a, a sleeping room. But we can pick up some of, uh, of this information from looking at things like the student newspaper, the Delphic. This 1905 cartoon is calling attention to boarding clubs that fed students. And students also ate meals at nearby cafes and drugstore lunch counters and soda fountains. Again, through advertisements, we can find that information out. We can see that they're targeting the student population. By the 1920s, much of the Drake neighborhood had been subdivided. Um, that happened around the campus first and then farther west later. And then by the 1940s, most of the housing was in place throughout the neighborhood. At the same time that land platting was drawing to a close around the university, another form of off-campus housing was on the rise, and that was of Greek fraternities and sororities. Early attempts at forming Greek societies had been quashed by university leaders, but by the early 1900s, students were less conservative and more interested in the social and leadership training and other benefits of Greek life. Students formed um, housing clubs, which were often disguised Greek houses. They would have a code name that related to the, um, the letters of the, the Greek house. By the 19-teens, however, Greek societies were more out in the open, and they were included in the yearbooks. And they also showed the role that they were playing in housing students. Um, some of the yearbooks showed the, you know, the number of students that were renting and the house that they were living in. And these kinds of photographs um, right now are on the website. Eventually, the Greek social system was officially welcomed by the university. And this can be seen in this unrealized campus plan from the late 1920s. It showed separate sorority and fraternity Greek rows, which are indicated by the red, oops, excuse me, the red areas here. This um, campus plan was debuted right before the Great Depression which obviously hampered fundraising, and so this plan was never realized. Instead, the Greek societies ended up renting houses throughout the Drake neighborhood, some as far east as 21st Street, and some as far west as 40th Street on Cottage Grove and 35th Street on Kingman. And eventually, there was the official formation of the Greek row on 34th Street. In the survey, we've documented some 150 different houses that Greek organizations occupied. Some, especially in the early days, were just, a, you know, on a year-to-year -year basis, an organization would be switching from house to house. And so the changing needs for um, the Greek societies, especially as they were growing in size, often led to change facades. And here's a really great example, um, a house located and still existent on Cottage Grove. On the left is the house before the renovation, on the right afterward. This evolution of single family housing to Greek housing often led to intensely subdivided apartment buildings after the Greek housing um, coalesced onto 34th Street. More information will be forthcoming about this um, impact and um, kind of the legacy that the Greek societies have left on housing. 
the research on that topic is still forthcoming. Um, currently, the, the website has more than 100 photos of Greek houses drawn mostly from the, the Quacks yearbooks, and they provide an important resource, both for homeowners who have um, their house pictured. It can give some wonderful clues about restoration if, if that's something that's needing to be done. And also to just um, further document kind of how the campus really extended throughout the neighborhood. What the record clearly shows is that student housing needs changed drastically after World War II. Thanks to the GI Bill, returning veterans spiked college enrollments throughout the United States. And married students, especially those with children, had very different needs. The university responded with a makeshift trailer camp north of campus, as well as temporary housing at Fort Des Moines. With the Great Depression and World War II over, students of the 1950s began to demand a much higher quality of housing. Rooming houses and apartments that had been very haphazardly carved out of single-family houses were no longer acceptable. One student's $6 a week, one-room basement quarters were featured in this 1954 yearbook story. And it was a testimonial for the university's campaign for additional dormitory space. The yearbook supported adding the on-campus housing instead of requiring, quote, off-campus rooming for much of the Drake enrollment. I'd like to close with one of my favorite pieces of research that's been done for the survey. It's an oral history conducted by Drake Jr. Grady Ruler, who interviewed Drake alumnus Donald Wine, class of 1946. The interview will be added to the online database. I'm going to be providing the Reader's Digest format of it tonight. Through an internship with Professor Carol Spalding Cruz's writing class, Grady conducted the first of what we hope will be many oral histories about the Drake student experience over time. Mr. Wine attended Drake beginning in 1940 with an interruption in his studies um, to serve his country during World War II. Then after graduation, he attended the University of Iowa Law School and went on to become a managing partner in what is now the Davis Brown Law Firm in downtown Des Moines. Mr. Wine shared his student housing experience, which began with him moving from his hometown and living um, his first semester with his aunt and uncle who had a home near Waveland Golf Course. At that time, he commuted via streetcar down to the Drake campus. He then worked two jobs to be able to afford tuition, room, and board, moving into an attic apartment at 23rd and Carpenter, and finally into a fraternity house at 34th Street. At the time that he attended Drake, the boundaries of the campus were mostly between 25th and 28th Streets, and the rest of the neighborhood, um, which now um, is covered by campus, was housing. So if you can try and imagine that, if you have not seen pictures or were, were not there to see it in person. I'm going to read some excerpts um, from the transcript, and they're illustrated by photographs from period yearbooks. Some of the pictures show Mr. Wine, um, some show the campus and other students in the neighborhood. The first question was, what were the criteria for selecting housing? Mr. Wine answered, money was the regulator. If you could afford to, you lived in the dorm rooms. If you couldn't afford it, you went out and looked for something cheaper. And most of them are what we would call boarding rooms. You didn't eat there, you just slept there. And maybe some of them had cooking facilities. We didn't have cooking facilities. We ate out all the time, in other words. There were a number of restaurants in Dogtown between 24th and 25th Streets on University Avenue. Tell me more about the rooming house. It wasn't fancy. There were three in my attic room and five or six students on the second floor. As a side note, the landlord, a widow, lived on the first floor. The bathroom was communal. We had about eight or ten people in one bathtub, so you had to take a number. And hot water was a problem. A lot of the hot water systems in homes were built around the furnaces, and only if the furnace was on would you have hot water. A different experience than today's students have, certainly. Did you ever feel like it was overcrowded? No, you didn't need much room. You'd have a corner of your own. You had your own desk, and you had your own footlocker, or whatever it was that you kept your food, and maybe some closet to hang your clothes. And you didn't have many clothes. I only had one suit. I thought we had adequate space, and I was happy there. And in the fraternity, it was pretty much the same. I moved to the SAE house, the Sigma Alpha um, Epsilon house, on 34th Street. And here's a picture of the house in 1938. I had five roommates, and we had a common sleeping area on the sun porch. 
without heat, so I had to have a lot of covers. It got pretty cold in the winter. How would you contrast your experiences of rooming versus living in the fraternity? The fraternity house had meals as well as a room, and we had parties and social events all the time. None of that was available in my rooming house. We didn't have parties. We were in an attic for crying out loud. We didn't have dances or social events. There were never any women that I saw in the rooming house at all. And men and women were segregated completely, the dorms and everywhere. So in the fraternity, we had women in the social rooms, and it was a far different social life. But other than that, as far as the adequacy of facilities and all that, they were about the same. Do you recall if anyone was unhappy with their housing situation? No, I never heard anyone say anything about it. You know, we had just come out of the worst. We were still in the deep depression, and people were glad to have a place to eat and sleep, and that was it. The Great Depression was a great leveler. Everybody was struggling to make out. Living was ordinary living. Everybody had about the same facilities. How receptive were Drake neighborhood homeowners to renting out rooms to students? It was the depression, and if you had extra rooms, you rented them out. And that's what happened all over the Drake neighborhood. I would say a high percentage of the buildings in the Drake neighborhood had students, maybe 75%. What was the impact of automobiles on off-campus living? There weren't many cars on campus. I had a car in my second semester, not a very good car, but I had a car because I had a church that was 25 miles away, so I had to have a car to get to the church. A side note, one of his jobs was preaching. But most of the students didn't have a car. I remember when I was in the fraternity, there was only one of our members who had a car besides me. You had no parking problems. I don't remember that they had parking lots. The streets were the main availability for parking. The streetcar system at the time was pretty adequate in Des Moines. You could get around very well. So it wasn't any problem to have public transportation. Upon your return to Drake after World War II um, service, did you notice a change in the housing situation? No, they were pretty much the same. I don't remember much about the cost, but it couldn't have been very much. I was always worried about tuition and food. Those were my big expenses. Now, since Mr. Wine graduated in 1946, the campus has greatly expanded, and many houses that um, were there when he was an, a student that have been torn down or moved. Despite all the changes that have happened over time, the original planning of the neighborhood survives today because it was well designed. The original grid system laid out by the university way back in 1881 remains easy to navigate. The housing stock has, pres has proved resilient. The quality construction has endured despite decades of deferred maintenance in some cases. And the size of the houses works for today's families. The core needs of students and faculty remain the same. Quality housing within walking distance of campus is just as convenient today as it was in 1881 in the 1940s of Mr. Wine and today. And the plan to surround the campus with a committed community is still important. Having a campus surrounded by homeowners still works to the advantage of the university because homeowners provide stability. The future of the university will forever be closely linked with that of the neighborhood. With that, I'll now turn the podium to Mara Lyons, who will discuss development of the on-campus aspect of student housing. Good evening. So in our tag team approach to this history, um, my role in the talk is to focus on the history of on-campus housing. And I'm going to be primarily looking at the 1940s through the 1970s. In addition to examining the impact of campus, of housing, um, I want to think about it in relationship to campus planning and the implications of this planning for the relationship between the university and, as, and its neighbors. Um, as Jen has demonstrated, the university's history and the neighborhood's history were connected from the beginning. And we'll see that in the post-war history, there was a shift toward a residential campus independent of the neighborhood. I'm going to end my part of the presentation today um, with the most recent campus plan and the most recent Drake-sponsored housing, which moved in a new direction um, because it's a partnership with private developer. Throughout my portion of the presentation, I'll feature photos, plans, and drawings, both from the archives here at Cole's Library, as well as other collections around the country. 
And I'm going to start by going back a little bit, um, retracing maybe a little bit of the ground that Jen covered in order to um, set things up for what happens after World War II. And I'm going back to this campus plan on the left from 1929 that you've seen. And one thing that I wanted to point out to you was um, the way that it is organized. Um, the central part of this plan in 1929 is this um, basically what I would call a campus street um, with landscaping around it, but a axis that unites University Avenue here with the stadium. And everything is really organized around that, um, that perimeter. And this was very much in keeping with the idea of using the existing street grid plan as a cue for what was happening on the campus. And again, this photograph that Jen had showed where you're looking down 26th Street from Old Main and the fact that there was a deliberate decision to place important buildings on campus in conformity with the streets that were already in place. So here's Old Main. You can see it's at the terminus of a street in a similar way that the stadium you know, was supposed to be the, f the um, visual end point for that corridor in the center. As Jen mentioned, this is a campus plan that was never enacted. But I think that one of the useful things about these plans is that it gives you a sense of how the institution saw itself at this period and um, also how it saw itself in relationship to its surroundings. Here there's very much a complementary relationship between the campus um, and, and the area around it. As one architect later put it, thinking about University Avenue as the front door of the university. As Jen mentioned, um, apart from the student home, the earliest on-campus residences were um, not built until the 1930s. And I'm showing you a photograph of Moore House, which was a women's dormitory on the upper left, and on the lower right, Jewett, um, which was built to house men. And just to reinforce the point that Jen has made about most students seeking their housing outside of the campus, um, in the period when these dormitories were built, Morehouse could accommodate 80 women and Jewett 60 men. So clearly, a large portion of the student population is finding house, housing elsewhere. Things really radically changed um, with the end of World War II. And there was an anticipation on the part of Drake that this, um, that the end of the war would offer possibilities in terms of the campus's expansion. And they wanted to be completely prepared for that. So even before the war ended, there was planning processes in place um, to try to imagine what a future campus would look like. And I'm showing you a plan from 1947. I'm sorry, that's a little bit faint. Um, but it was the result of um, a hire that Drake made the decision to hire Eliel Saarinen, um, who was a Finnish-born architect who had emigrated to the United States and was very known for his abilities in planning. And he was brought in to try to imagine what Drake would look like um, after World War II. And this is a period, as Jen had mentioned, where there is escalating enrollments and the idea that there was more to come. So um, in the years immediately after the war, enrollments at Drake um, just about tripled. So we're talking about huge numbers of students that um, began to be part of the community. And Drake's president at the time, Henry Harmon, um, was very clear about the fact that housing was a linchpin for the future development of the campus. And he impressed upon the Board of Trustees and others in reports that he wrote at the time that um, adequate modern housing on campus um, was going to be necessary to attract students. And he also noted that many of Drake's competitors in Iowa, other colleges and universities, were building housing on campus. And so Drake needed to keep up with that. So the kind of cobbled together housing that had existed, including the trailers and, and some other converted structures, was no longer going to be adequate. If you look at the this 1947 plan um, in comparison with the 1929 plan, there are lots of changes that happen. For one thing, you don't have the axis of the stadium emphasized anymore, if you can see that. So here is the stadium, and there really isn't any kind of visual relationship. 
In fact, as you look at this plan, you can see that it doesn't follow the street grid plan anymore. Instead, it, there are irregularly shaped areas that are defined by these proposed new buildings. And all of this was intended to be landscaped. So your ex experience of the interior of the campus would not be that large scale street, but instead green spaces that would have some paths across them. Already we can begin to see an emphasis toward the center or the interior of the campus rather than thinking about landmarks outside of the campus. And I think that's a really important shift to make note of. I'd also point out that in this plan, oh, sorry, get back. There's a little dotted area where Old Main was <laughs> at the time that this was created. And it's clear from this plan that the architects are proposing to get rid of Old Main, what is now the iconic building of the Drake campus, right? Um, but that was not necessarily thought to be part of the future. And I think that building on the axis with the neighborhood, that is a, a really important symbolic decision to um, imagine a different kind of configuration. And along this western perimeter of this proposed new campus um, were a series of residential complexes, both for men and women. So the idea that housing was going to be a major portion of this imagined campus expansion. This is um, a plan a little bit closer to what actually got um, enacted at Drake. And I'm going to focus first on this cluster of dormitories and the dining hall um, in this corner of the campus. And you can see this is the existing campus, what had, was already in place around 1950, Old Main here. The campus development was proposed um, toward the west and moving further north than it had been before. The decision was made um, by Elio Saarinen, who was then um, joined in the efforts by his son, Aero Saarinen, to place the women's dormitories, which were the first on-campus dormitories in the post-war period to be built in this area, because there was an existing ravine here. And the idea was that would provide what um, I saw referred to in one source as a romantic location um, for the women's residences. And from the very beginning, there was the idea that not only would dorms be built, but also a dining hall. Um, so shifting that focus toward the idea that you would get your meals somewhere else and thinking about that as a service that would be provided um, within the campus. These three dorms were intended to house 585 women. So we're talking about exponential jump in the number of spaces that were available on campus. The other thing I want to point out before I go forward, too, is that each one of these dorms, if you can see these little projecting um, rooms, those are what are called social rooms, and they still exist in what we know as the quad dorms today. And I will show you an interior photograph of one of those social rooms. Um, so just so that you can imagine, you've got three dorms that circle around the dining hall, um, and a pond was put in the place where the ravine had stood. Because this was a new idea for Drake to imagine a residential campus, there actually is quite a lot of promotional material that was put out by the university to explain the housing and to explain its benefits. And this is a promotional pamphlet in the archives here um, that is introducing to students and to the larger community the new residence hall um, and the, the dining room. And this is a photograph of one of those do women's dorms um, when it was completed in the 1950s. And maybe a little bit more spacious if you're three to a room <laughs> in boarding houses elsewhere. Although I think to most students today, this would seem rather spare. But this is a photograph of one of those social rooms. And the idea of the architect was that um, trying to provide spaces within this dormitory complex, not just for dorm rooms, but where people could gather with friends um, in larger groups. And they imagined these social rooms as being an intermediary between the more private space of the dorm room and the pretty large public space of the dining hall. And that these social rooms would be places where you could get together with people who lived in your dorm, you could have visitors, um, but they are social spaces on campus. 
As I mentioned from the beginning, there was an idea not only to provide housing, but also easily accessible um, dining facilities um, for the students who would uh, inhabit these new dorms. And I'm showing you photographs of Hubble Hall, um, which still stands, but had an addition made to it in the 1960s. An exterior view here, an interior view looking back toward the quad dorms um, on the right-hand side. And you might have noticed this in the plan, and it's visible in these photographs. The dorms were connected to the dining hall through the bridges, through walkways, um, and in terms of this kind of clustering idea. And the drawing below shows the main dining room with um, the original location of Stuart da Davis's Allée mural, which is now in the second floor of the Olmsted Center. So the notion was that you wouldn't have to leave campus for your meals and that this dining facility would accommodate anybody on campus who wanted to make use of it. Initially, there had been some debate about putting a dining room in each one of the three dorms. And that was decided that it was not cost effective. Um, and one of my favorite all-time quotations to come out of this research is in an architectural journal. Um, they were talking about this decision about the, the dining hall and where to put it. They decided to go with the central dining hall because, and I quote, the Saarinans have concluded that Midwestern college girls are not averse to an outdoor walk to meals. So, kind of tribute to the hardiness of the Midwestern female. <laughs> now, this imagination of a, a residential campus only expands as you go further in time. And this is a proposed campus plan that was published in the Des Moines Register in 1960. And I think, you know, even in looking at this plan, you can get a sense of how the university imagined a growing independence of the campus from the neighborhood. It's becoming a more distinct area. Um, it's becoming something that is, you know, defined visually, even though, as Jen pointed out, um, at this point, there are still private homes that do exist where these proposed buildings are. Um, but the vision is to have, you know, this unified campus. And that's accentuated by the plantings. So, Part of what defines the perimeter of the campus are trees and bushes that line those boundaries and make physical and visual separations between the interior of the campus and what surrounds it. And here is the, dormit the women's dormitory complex we've just been looking at. I'm going to now turn my attention to the plans for men's housing. And that was this quadrant of the campus that was next in the line of development as well as married student housing, which was part of this proposal in 1960. So here's a very um, preliminary plan for the men's dorm complex that was proposed in the late 50s um, by an architectural firm based in Chicago named Harry Wieson Associates. And the vision at this point, and what you're looking at is a photograph of the model, the architectural model for the dorm. Three interconnected buildings, and the initial proposal was to have a separate dining hall just for the men's, um, the men's residential complex. So there was an idea that there would be a women's dining hall and a men's dining hall. Um, this men's dining hall never came to fruition, but it was part of this ambitious plan. And I just want to point out in the photograph, um, in order to make it dramatic, there is a mountainous backdrop <laughs> to the model, which may be not quite accurate in terms of the topography of, of Des Moines and the, the immediate campus surroundings. <laughs> this is an early um, drawing of what those men's dorms might look like using the brick material that you find elsewhere on campus. So a, an, a, a vision of what the exterior of those buildings might look like. But I want to draw your attention to an inscription that's in the right-hand corner of that drawing. And it's talking a little bit about how the need to express from the outside what you see inside. And I'll just read part of this inscription. It says, large room, large window. Small room, small window. All panels equal. All cent uh, center lights equal. And then there is 
this inscription below that, which I don't know if it's a mistranslation of the, the French Revolution motto um, or a modification of it, but it says, Egalite, Humanite, Fraternite. Um, so equality, humanity, and brotherhood. And I think that's a fascinating commentary. Is that the architect saying, you know, talking about the structure and everything will be equal? Is it talking about the equality of the people who will reside here and trying to foster a sense of brotherhood? Um, I mean, it seems like it maybe operates on more than one level. And when I did some research in terms of you know, the men's housing, some of the student government was actually organized at that time according to what floor you lived on in, in different dorms. So this notion of trying to foster a sense of community and a sense of structure, um, all of those things need to be created at Drake because there isn't a precedent for that kind of residential life. And here is a photograph on the left of um, the men's dorms as they were completed, what is now Goodwin Kirk. And one of the features of those dorm rooms are the bay windows, um, which give some interest to the exterior of the building, get let light in. And I wanted to show it to you um, in comparison with a drawing that I just found in a recent trip to Chicago. And it's one of Harry Weiss's drawings of what this, these men's dorms might look like. And it shows. Um, a male student sitting in the window, on the window seat, surrounded by his possessions and the other um, parts of the dorm room. And in fact, um, Bart Schmidt uncovered a photograph from those same dorm rooms where you can see it pretty much turns out as the architect imagines with that very prominent window, um, the window seats actually even being used in, um, in this particular photograph. As in the women's dorms, there was an attention to social spaces within the dormitory complex where people could gather. Again, you know, the emphasis is on on-campus kinds of um, entertainment and gathering. And here you see some of the students playing pool. There are tables, sorry, there are tables in the back that have checkerboards and chessboards. Um, so the fact that within this complex, you could have lots of different things um, different kind of needs satisfied it within the same physical space. And I just want to very briefly say, um, as I was reading through, there are handbooks preserved from Drake life, you know, from year to year, um, which are pretty fascinating reading, I have to say. And in 1966, I just wanted to tell you about two regulations that stood out to me. One of them being, um, and again, it's 1966, the dress regulations um, for men and women at the time. Men at this point were not allowed to wear jeans in the dining hall or in class. And perhaps even more dramatically, women were not allowed to wear slacks at all unless the temperature was below zero. <laughs> so as my husband said, you know, you just have this vision of these girls in the dorm room saying, oh, please, let it get a little colder so I can wear my slacks. <laughs> But I think that's part and parcel with the idea of creating some kind of sense that you belong to a community and there are also responsibilities that you have to the community um, and creating some kind of code to live by no matter if you're in the dorms or other spaces on campus. I mentioned too that one of the um, populations that was targeted um, for housing so that they would remain within the confines of the campus um, was married students. And as Jen had mentioned, you know, uh, returning GIs um, a bit older than um, their counterparts, some with young families. And this is a drawing, again by Harry Weiss and Associates, that imagines three separate apartment buildings that would be dedicated um, to to married student housing. And I love this drawing because it has the woman um, with, the, with the carriage in the foreground. But in researching some of this and in, in archives in Chicago, um, Harry Weiss's notebooks are preserved. And he is taking notes clearly at a meeting with some Drake representatives about this married student housing. And it's almost as if you know the university is articulating how they could compete with other housing options in Des Moines. So they tell him that it would probably be used by couples um, with small children, a toddler age. They impress upon him that they want this to be cost effective and no frills, but not barren. And they 
want it to be both gracious and comfortable. Um, so kind of what architects always say that clients always want, right? The, the best of all worlds, but cheap. <laughs> And another thing that I thought that he wrote down was interesting, um, one of the prerequisites was soundproofing. So that one family wouldn't necessarily feel like they're living right on top of another. In the end, only one of these buildings was created, and that's Ross Hall, which has been converted um, to, to just general student housing. But it had 49 units that included both one bedroom and two bedroom apartments. And the kitchens were part of you know, each of those apartments. So the university is beginning to you know, identify and try to satisfy the needs of these different groups, simultaneously trying to keep those groups on campus. And I see yet another step in that idea of self-containment or independence from the neighborhood in the fact that in the 1970s, the university decided to go ahead and build a student center, a multi-purpose facility um, that would be a place where there would be student offices, where there would be food and entertainment. Um, again, with the emphasis being on, on the campus. Harry Wiesen Associates also got the job to build this, um, this student center. And I wanted to point out in this site plan, just to orient you, the proposed student union is in the light blue. And you can see that it's in that residential western edge of the campus between the women's dorms and the men's dorms. It's also directly adjacent to the dining hall, so yet another complement to that area and that zone of residential life. And here's a drawing of the exterior seen from the south. One of the ways that the architect described this design, particularly the entrances, was to give people the idea of walking into an enclosed shopping mall. And I read that to mean um, a place where there are multiple kind of things that you could seek out. Different interior spaces, different kinds of possibilities that you would find inside. Like in the dorms, there were provisions made for both um, interior gathering spaces as well as exterior ones. And the plans for the building um, included such facilities as a game room, a uh, music room where it was promoted that it would have quadraphonic sound. Um, there was a, what is now Bulldog Theater. Um, movies were regularly shown there. And another feature of the building was a Rathskeller um, where people could buy alcoholic beverages. And I'm showing you the first floor plan of Olmsted in the upper left here. And there's a dining area of that. But this whole area was the Rathskeller and they would book entertainment. Um, again, the emphasis is on having student entertainment and um, social life be happening on campus rather than off campus. And as one TD article put it very succinctly in 1975, let's face it, beer attracts people. <laughs> and I think it would be interesting to research more what was some of the impact on local businesses of some of these changes? Clearly there were some benefits to local businesses to having a concentrated a group of people living on campus. You know, certainly all of their needs were not met on campus, but at the same time there has to have been some impact um, with some of these different facilities in terms of, you know, what, what businesses had um, expected and the kind of volume they'd had in the past. And in fact, in doing research in the late 1970s, there was some explicit tension between a local hotel, motel organization um, and the university over Olmsted Center. Um, and the problem was that, the, uh, that Olmsted was offering catering services and event planning. And this trade organization locally said, well, wait, Drake is tra tax exempt, and that means it can um, offer lower prices than, than many of our members can. And so um, kind of bringing to the public's view, is this a university building? Is it not a university building? You know, kind of what's the relationship here? Um, and the university, in fact, did decide in order to avoid the perception of a conflict of interest that they would suspend the use of the space by outside groups. Um, so I, I'm sure that there's a bigger story there in terms of, you know, the, the kind of business dynamic um, that was happening at the time. I want to conclude by looking at the most recent campus plan, um, which was unveiled in 2005. And I really see it as a reversal of many of the 20th century, mid-20th century proposals for the campus. 
among many other suggestions, one of the things that was um, proposed by the campus planners was to soften that border between the campus and its surroundings. Um, doing, using landscaping, for example, to create more of a sense of continuity. And some of you might remember that there used to be a very prominent hedge right in front of Old Main going around the corner, wrapping around toward Howard Hall, which was removed a couple of years ago. That was a very deliberate decision to try to get away from that idea of physically defining and blocking off the campus and making it seem as though it was separate um, from what surrounded it. The other thing that I wanted to mention is an experiment with a different kind of housing. And that's um, the partnership that, of the university with a private development company um, to create the West Village. And once again, there's a very specific demographic that was, um, that was intended, this was intended to serve, juniors, seniors at Drake, as well as graduate students. And it's interesting to me that the promotional material for the West Village um, talks about creating a village-like environment rather than an institutional one. And I think you see some of the shifting tastes and the priorities over time with that distinction. So what in the 1950s um, was this exciting great thing to have campus housing that was built by the university and within the campus, um, all of a sudden taste, some tastes have changed and there is an idea of being within easy access to the campus but having some measure of independence. And in fact, um, these, the two buildings that are part of the West Village offer some services that are in fact duplicated on campus. So there are exercise facilities, there's a game room that's part of the West Village, there are businesses, there's a Starbucks. Um, so it always almost is a kind of independent enclave at the same time that clearly it's, it's you know, main audience is people who are somehow connected to the university. And it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. So housing has always been a linking feature between the neighborhood and the campus, a source over the years of both tension um, and benefits. And as Jen had pointed out, the health of one is certainly dependent on the health of the other. I'm hoping that our presentation tonight is the beginnings of a more integrated history of the area. And I just want to conclude, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot about this. This is a photograph of the interior of, of the West Village and a typical floor plan. Again, more of an in apartment style than um, a dorm room style. I just wanted to show you um, the, just briefly the website that Bart mentioned that students at Drake designed. If you're interested in that immediate post-war period um, of the campus's history, there are video tours of many of the prominent buildings and other information that is accessible to you at all times um, going through the library website. So thank you very much. <laughs>